Okay, you probably clicked on this video thinking that I'll be synthesizing some incredibly complex organic compound like, I don't know, 2,2-prime-azobis-2-methylpropionitrile, but no. This chemical is almost too simple. A humble salt that is not only an inorganic oxidizing agent, a catalyst for aromatic reactions, or widely used Lewis acid, but also an etchant for electronics, a coagulant for water treatment, and a precursor for pigments. In other words, whole industries rely upon it. Honestly, there are few compounds that are this versatile, and today I will be making the most comprehensive video on its synthesis and applications. The one behind all of this is none other than ferric chloride. You've never appreciated or thought twice about it, and if you click off now, well, you've kind of proven my point. But the ones who stay, thank you for taking a moment to see how the simplest of things can sometimes be the most powerful. Alright, intro's over. No, seriously. Step 1. Get the materials. Now to make this ferric chloride, also known as iron 3 chloride, it is actually rather simple and all you'll need is 3 chemicals. Some iron, hydrochloric acid, and 3% hydrogen peroxide. You can also use a higher percentage of peroxide if you have access to it, as I actually have 50% hydrogen peroxide. I would be careful though, as it might get really hot if you use a concentration too high in a later step, as the reaction involving the chemical is really exothermic. Step 2. Set up the reaction. After calculating the stoichiometric amounts we'll need for each chemical, I can set up the reaction. Onto a scale with a 1 liter Erlenmeyer flask, I measured out around 50 grams of iron powder. It actually surprised me how much 50 grams was. After this, I then poured around 200 mL of water into the Erlenmeyer flask so that the acid wouldn't be too concentrated and also to dilute the resulting solution a bit. Finally, I cracked open a bottle of 37% hydrochloric acid, or 12 molar solution of it. It always delights me how the majestic HCl aerosols diffuse out from the opening every time I open one of these bottles. They're beautiful, but at the same time extremely corrosive, so I made sure to pour in 150 ml of the acid into the flask in a fume hood to not breathe them in. Opening a bottle of HCl is like opening a can of soda. Feel the burn without the calories. Step 3. Reacting. Now immediately after adding in the HCl solution, the Erlenmeyer flask starts bubbling violently and it also starts heating up a fair amount. If you look closely, the solution also begins developing a green tint to it, indicating the production of green iron 2 chloride. A lot of acid vapors are also released, and you really don't want to breathe them in. You can also see the effectiveness of a fume hood pulling in vapors when I shoot from the side. The reaction, although simple, is still one that I really like because of how beautiful it looks. I remember being captivated by the formation of these bubbles and the color change when I was younger. This is because it is also often taught in high school chemistry courses, as it is a great example of a single displacement reaction. What's happening here right now is described by the reaction shown. Solid iron powder is displacing the hydrogen from hydrochloric acid, forming ferrous chloride and releasing hydrogen gas. This is because, under reactivity series, iron is above hydrogen, so it's more reactive. Step 4. Refluxing now back to our 1 liter Erlenmeyer flask, you can see the bubbling still taking place, but it might take a very long time, and I mean a very, very long time, like a couple of days if you don't give it an extra push. GTA 6 might even come out before this reaction finishes. To actually make the reaction faster though, you're going to need to heat things up. In order to not lose our reactants, we can set up a reflux. Before I set up the reflux though, I got distracted and actually wanted to try something out, because since this reaction produces hydrogen gas, I decided to bring a flame close to it to see if it pops. As you can see, it initially does make a nice sound, but to my surprise, it didn't just stop there. If I dim the lights a bit more, you can see that the hydrogen coming from the reaction is being produced in a balanced amount such that the flame can be sustained at the neck of the flask, which is actually really cool and I haven't seen anything like that before. It's almost like a candle before a chem majors, and what would be even cooler was if we had some copper ions there to make it glow green. Anyways, putting on my Liebig condenser, I can finally crank up the heat and also threw in a stir bar, but it kind of just gave up and <laughs> didn't really work as I think all the iron powder just absolutely destroyed it. It just clung entirely onto that bar. Bro really said he isn't paid enough for this. Now the reaction was really getting started. I let the reflux run for a couple more hours until normal iron filings were visible. Step 5. Filtration. 
as the reaction died down, the Erlenmeyer flask wasn't filled with a nice green color, but instead a murky grayish one. Now I thought I'd done something wrong until I realized that it might just be due to some iron hydroxide that form if it's exposed to too much oxygen, and that's probably the case. The most straightforward way to get rid of this was a filtration, and so I decided to just go for it. After pouring it through a fritted funnel without a vacuum, you can see on the other side just how clear and green it becomes. It has a brilliant emerald color and it's one of my favorite colors in chemistry, other than the blue of copper sulfate. This is in fact due to the promotion of electrons in the d orbitals that lead to absorption of red, orange, and violet light. After patiently waiting for all of the liquid to filter through, you can see I collected a good amount of solution and above the fritted funnel were the insoluble impurities. Finally, I placed the ferrous chloride into an ice bath to cool it down for the next step. Step 6. Oxidation Now this step is where the hydrogen peroxide comes into play. Earlier, I had a 3% solution of peroxide, but I realized that if I were going to use it to oxidize the ferrous chloride into ferric chloride, I need to pour in a whole bottle. At that point, it'd be way too diluted. So I decided to grab my 50% hydrogen peroxide and pour out just a tiny beaker of it diluted with some more water. You can see just how little I'll need compared to the 3%. Then, you'll want to slowly pour in the solution bit by bit, as it does heat up quite a lot. The more concentrated, the hotter it will get as well, so you should be more careful with 50%. As you can see, when I put in a drop of the peroxide, you can hear a nice sizzling sound, and the area around it turning brown. This is the ferrous chloride being converted into ferric chloride through the following reaction. The reaction is again a redox one, as the peroxide is taking away electrons from the iron 2+, oxidizing it into iron 3+, and turning into water. At one point, I got bored of putting it in drop by drop, so I decided to start using the beaker spout to pour it in. Don't pour in too much at once because it could start rapidly boiling and splattering everywhere, which would be extremely dangerous, and also why you should do this in a fume hood with goggles, gloves, and a lab coat. What's really fascinating as well is that these iron salts are generally very acidic. The iron 3 plus cation actually exists as an octahedral hexaqua iron 3 ion complex with six coordinate water ligands. Each of these bonds are coordinate bonds where both electrons come from the oxygen on water to stabilize the dense positive plus 3 charge. Thus, FeCl3 is a really good Lewis acid due to its ability to accept electrons. It's also especially acidic due to the fact that its coordination complex can throw away protons. As you can see in the diagram, electron density from electronegative oxygens is actually being shifted towards the positive center, and the electron bonding pairs on the hydrogens now not only feel the pull of the oxygen, but also of the central ferric ion. Thus, these electrons are strained further, making the hydrogens even more positive and can easily pop off making this entire complex have a low pKa. Therefore, due to the electron density shifts created by the 3 plus ion, the entire charge is no longer only on the ferric ion, but spread out around the complex, especially the hydrogens on the edges. When all of the peroxide solution was dumped in, you can finally see how dark and brown it is, and now it's time for me to attempt some fun things with this solution. Step 7. Making a cool complex. Now I'm going to be doing one of the coolest reactions that at least I've seen, and it's also great for Halloween. This is called the fake blood demonstration, and it's an equilibrium reaction between ferric chloride and potassium thiocyanate. Now into the first beaker, I made a dilute solution of ferric chloride. In the second beaker, I made another solution of potassium thiocyanate. Now if I pour the thiocyanate solution on my hand, and then slide a spoon dipped in the ferric chloride solution on my palm, when the two solutions mix, they form this blood red complex, almost like real blood. It's quite magical honestly. In fact, if I mix the two on a watch glass, you can see just how red and dark the mixture becomes. What's also cool is that because this is an equilibrium reaction, it can locally favor the formation of the complex, but once mixed and diluted, the equilibrium shifts back towards the uncomplexed ions. FeCl3 is so useful because it is employed a lot in laboratories. For example, there's something called a ferric chloride phenol test, which is when dilute drops of FeCl3 is dropped into a substance to test the presence of phenols. Here you can see my setup, which is a test tube held by a stand, and into it, I professionally transferred in a couple mils of ethanol, and dissolved some salicylic acid into it. I chose ethanol as the solvent here, as salicylic acid is not very soluble in water. Then, adding in our ferric chloride, you can see a beautiful purple color forming, as it contains a phenol group. I wanted to add this in just in case you didn't see the previous video, where I did this on my super long aspirin pills to salicylic acid process. Step 8. Etching. Now if you guys didn't know, one reason why ferric chloride is so useful is because of its industrial use of metal etching, specifically copper. 
it is a crucial part of the PCB industry as well. As the most common etchant, it is relatively safe and is unique due to its ability to directly oxidize metals. So I decided to try it out on a piece of stainless steel, specifically this round stainless steel plate I had. The thing is, it had some stains on it and so I tried to clean it using some vinegar, salt, and even baking soda but that didn't really work. So instead, I got a stainless steel plate and decided to tape on a shape. Can you guys guess it? It's a molecule, yeah. After struggling around a bit, it's a benzene ring. Then, into the plate, I poured in some ferric chloride solution, and what should happen is that the exposed metal would be etched, but the parts covered in the tape would be untouched, leaving me with a nice benzene ring pattern, hopefully. It may take a while as ferric chloride isn't the best at etching steel, so I set it aside and moved on to another demonstration. Step 9. Coagulation Another reason ferric chloride is hands down the most useful iron salt is also because of its industrial application in water treatment. Namely, ferric chloride is extremely popular because of its ability to coagulate solid impurities. The reason your drinking water is clean might just be because of this salt. I really wanted to demonstrate how this works, and so I tried it out with a variety of suspended solids. First, I tried some starch. So into two beakers I each put a spoonful of starch, and mixed it around a good amount, and onto the right I poured a bit of our ferric chloride. I waited, waited, and waited, like literally forever, but it seemed that nothing much happened. Maybe the solution was too thick, or that its coagulation abilities don't work for starch. So I tried another solution, with soil this time, yes, from outside. Into each beaker, I scooped in a tiny amount of the soil as to not make it too heavy like the starch previously, mixed it well, and brought it back to the lab. Then, again on the right side beaker, I poured in some ferric chloride, and the one on the left acts as a control. For one more time, I patiently waited and stared into the fume hood for a solid 30 minutes, questioning my life choices but it didn't seem like it was doing anything. I even added some baking soda as it works better in a more basic environment, but unfortunately, nothing again, other than a bunch of precipitate and bubbles forming. I was really starting to get confused and frustrated, and so I went online to read some research papers. Strangely, they called the coagulation test a jar test. Specifically, I found many videos and research papers that use ferric chloride, but the impurity they use is specifically something called betonite, or ben bentonite which is apparently a type of clay. Now, I don't have access to this yet, but once I do, I'll try to see if I can make a short about it. Step 10, reactions. Wait, I just realized, I forgot to tell you about this, but ferric chloride is an extremely useful inorganic salt in various organic reactions. This can be seen through its use as a Lewis acid catalyst. Its ability to accept electron pairs makes it extremely valuable in activating substrates and facilitating a variety of organic transformations. One of its most well-known applications is in electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, where it can generate highly reactive electrophiles that attack aromatic rings. For example, in the chlorination of benzene, ferric chloride reacts with chlorine gas to produce the chloronium ion, which is the true electrophile that substitutes onto the aromatic system. It also plays a key role in Friedel Crafts acylation and alkylation reactions, serving as a Lewis acid to stabilize carbocation intermediates and enhance the reactivity of acyl and alkyl halides. Beyond substitution reactions, ferric chloride is used in oxidative coupling processes, where it can help form carbon-carbon bonds in certain conditions. These are but a few of the reactions ferric chloride is used in, and I'm sure you'll be able to find so many more if you search for them. Step 11. Evaluate. Now back to our steel plate, I have left it to react for a couple of days now and you can see the ferric hydroxide that formed as a result of the oxidation. Dumping out the solution and cleaning it up a bit, you can see that a bunch of weird black spots formed but it didn't seem like it was able to etch stainless steel. I already predicted this, and this is because it etches copper the best, but is kind of useless against stainless steel. I mean, the name literally has stainless in it. At least I made some stylish black rust stains, I guess. The only reason I tested it was because I didn't have any copper on hand. But wait, I then suddenly realized I do have some copper with me right now. So out of my pocket, I grabbed a penny. And since pennies are coated with a layer of zip, I mean, a layer of copper, ferric chloride should be able to etch this, and so I dropped it in the ferric chloride halfway using some tongs to see what would happen. When I took it out, you can visibly see the orange etched side and the shiny unetched side. With another penny I used, the difference is even more pronounced. Pretty cool, right? I really wished I had a copper plate though, so I can tape on a benzene ring. I might do that in the future when I get the chance. Anyways guys, this was a really fun journey and I hope you learned just as much as I did. I genuinely want to thank you as a top 16% for making it to this point in the video. Now you have the privilege to leave me a comment on what to do with this half a liter of ferric chloride, as I have no idea currently. Step 12. Support Carbon 12. Again, this video perfectly has 12 steps. 
If you made it here, congrats. Genuinely, I want to thank you so much, and if you could, please click the subscribe button down below. It means a lot. I really want to thank my patrons as well, whether on YouTube or Patreon, for supporting me on this unorthodox Garage Lab journey and allowing this to all be possible. I will provide behind the scenes, early access, shoutouts, and more. If you would like to support a high school student like me, just a couple of dollars will go a long way in helping this channel to continue providing quality and educational chem content. Anyways, thank you so much for watching till the end, and please consider clicking the subscribe button below.